Okay, so <clears throat> today we'll talk about, we'll talk about uh, two architects. Well, the second one is rather a designer, but um, he also built. But let's start with Carlo Maderno, 1556-1629. So Carlo Maderno uh, was a Roman architect whose career bridged the gap between the gap, the gap between the late Renaissance and the early Baroque. He was born into a family of architects whom he worked with in the late 15th century on various architectural projects around Rome. His early style reflected his training in the late Renaissance style of Rome. His first major project as an independent architect was the renovation of the Church of Santa Susana. Later, he built the nearby Church of Santa Maria della Vittoria and completed the unfinished church of Sant Andrea della Valle. So at the beginning of the 17th century, he's perhaps most famous for working on the design of St. Peter's Basilica between the years of 1603 and 1625. So for uh, 22 years, he worked for um, uh, St. Peter. San Pietro. He's also recognized for his work on secular buildings, most notably the Palazzo Mattei di Giove, the Villa Aldo Brandini in Frascati, and the famous Palazzo Barberini, begun in 1628. Although Maderno was a skilled all-around architect, he's most celebrated for his facades, which came to define the Baroque church facade in Rome. Maderno drew inspiration for his facades from the famous late Renaissance Jesuit church in Rome, Il Gesù, which is characterized by a two-story facade, scrolling volutes that connect the upper and lower levels and the large triangular pediment at the top. So let's begin with Santa Susanna Church in Rome. And I like the fact that... Uh, you know, the, the, the Italian uh, language sounds so good uh, on, on the background of, uh, uh, or in front of a background with, uh, or on, the, on a background of, uh, of, of, of English, uh, you know, of, of English, yes. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this is, uh, this is uh, Santa Susanna. Nice name, Santa Susanna Church in Rome. And as we learned, Carlo Maderno was a specialist in facades, but he didn't do just facades. So we understood that he stood somewhere in between late Renaissance and the beginnings of the Baroque. Rome, of course, had great Baroque architecture and great Baroque architects like Bernini and Borromini, to mention two, two great rivals. Uh, these architects were artists, you know, they, uh, they, they all, uh, uh, you know, they painted, they sculpted, they made architecture, they drew, they, you know, they did many things relating to art. Uh, it was inconceivable at that time to have an architect who was not also, at least to an extent, an artist. Uh, Andrea Palladio was a different case. Palladio was rather an architect, but what an architect. He didn't have to be also a painter or a sculptor. He was so-called just an architect, but what an architect, the paradigmatic, the quintessential architect, Andrea Palladio. But this facade by Carlo Maderno is not bad either. Um, so he was indeed a, a major architect since he was uh, you know, commissioned to work for 22 years or so for uh, San Pietro. And uh, for San Pietro work to meet Michelangelo, uh, Bernini, Raphael, and others. Initially, Bramante did a scheme, but was not quite developed, was not developed. And uh, Michelangelo did a plan for that, had some relationship with the, the scheme proposed by Bramante. Then uh, Raphael made an, another scheme which was not developed. Michelangelo was, and then Carlo Maderno came in and uh, uh, changed uh, uh, 
uh, rather da- dramatically, but will arrive at, at, at San Pietro very soon. Santa Maria de la Vittoria, Rome. Here it is, Carlo Maderno. Santa Maria de la Vittoria. I like Baroque architecture, and although we we are confronted now with uh, all kinds of crises and uh, sustainability problems and uh, climate change and so on, I think the Baroque could have a future, even or maybe even particularly because we are confronted with many problems. Maybe we could, uh, you know, here and there, create some things uh, with with the exuberance that the Baroque was capable of conveying. And as you see here, you know, a a, a Baroque architecture indeed, very rich. A a different world now, we we don't do this sort of thing any longer, but we, uh, we acknowledge beauty in whatever form it shows up. Well, he didn't do the frescoes, he didn't do the paintings, but uh, he did the architecture and then he, he employed, uh, you know, helpers coming from sculpture and painting and so on. But it's very, very decorated, as you can see. A modernity banished uh, ornament and decoration, but sometimes I think it is a loss. Now, this is the work of Bernini, actually, a very famous work, work. The great Baroque artist and architect, one of the greatest. The one that, uh, you know, apparently Bernini committed suicide because he was in a competition with Bernini. And uh, I read that some people think that he was very depressed because as opposed to Bernini, Boromini was um, didn't have social skills. Uh, he, he was not a pleaser. He was a difficult man. While Bernini was very successful at uh, you know promoting himself and having a dialogue with possible clients. Of course, most of them belonging to the church. So it's it's worth not, uh, knowing that uh, this famous. Um, uh, sculpture by uh, Bernini is in a church by Maderno. The riches of uh, of Rome are uh, beyond words, really. In my opinion, is richer than Paris, Rome, and is older. And this is the the great work by, uh, by Bernini. Baroque also, very much so. Palazzo Mattei di Giove, 1598-1617. A palace, a secular work, but uh, as you can see, even if it was a secular work, beauty was of high concern and uh, statues and decorations and so on. All these contributed to this quest for, uh, for beauty or what we call beauty, even though, you know, if we are to define it, it's not so easy. Outside the building is almost stern. It's still a a Renaissance building. But the church on the right is, is Baroque, but the palace Now, there is a difference, of course, because there are two different programs on the left, secular, on the right, uh, sacred. Interesting plan, too, when you look at those uh, rooms that are, uh, you know, uh, at, at various angles. It's almost like a small city 
was it Palladio or who said it that uh, I think Palladio said it too, but maybe other people said it too that you know uh, uh, a villa should be like a small city and the city should be like a big villa. But you can extrapolate and you could say, you know, the, the room, I mean, you start with a small unit, the room, and the room is like the villa and the villa is like the street and the street is like the city and vice versa, I, meaning the coagulation of the, of the elements that compose a room, um, um, you know, a house, a street or a cluster of buildings and then the city. Uh, that that coagulation is uh, in spirit uh, and sometimes even in form uh, similar. It, it, just the dimensions are are different. But you could approximate that a building is a city, and vice versa. You could say that a city is like a villa, well, a large villa. It's the relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. I wonder why these people, you know, they couldn't do without having, uh, you know, uh, base reliefs, uh, sculptures, while, while we cannot do with them. I mean, what architect today would employ, um, you know, heads of people or sculptures or uh, base reliefs, although they are coming back. There are attempts in this direction to bring back figurative art into architecture. And one example, extreme and uh, neurotical almost, as, as I might call him, is Mark Foster Gage, who is still a young architect and teaches at uh, Yale University in the United States. Mark Foster Gage. He's not the only one. Now, another villa, Villa Aldo Brandini in Frascati, 1603-1621. Again, Maderno, Carlo Maderno, who died on the 30th of, of January. By the way, do you know that the name of, of this month, January, comes from the, the ancient god, the Roman god of Janus, J-A-N-U-S was a god with two faces looking in two opposite directions and he was the god of, uh, of doorways and gates and um, entrances and exits and that's why January comes from Janus because it's the the transition between the end of a one, one year and the beginning of another so Janus also being the the god of the doorways of the entrances it's also the God that generated the name of the month that means the beginning of a new year, the entrance into a new year. So January comes from Janus, a very interesting God with two faces looking two opposite ways. Some people lived well. What can we say? Not everybody, of course, lived like this, very few. Frascati, how is it called this villa? Villa Aldo Brandini in Frascati. A big estate and then um, riches over riches. What can we do? There is inequality, inequality, inequity. I don't know. I don't know any longer English, but look what's going on here. You know, it's, it's, it's for the joy of, of, of the eye and the joy of the soul. And it's, it's mythology here and all kinds of narrative. This is a narrative architecture, something we don't do these days. We don't tell stories through our walls, through our buildings. But at that time, narration was very important. And, you know, people knew mythology. They, 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 they knew what this figure represented. Um, from today, it's, it's very difficult to, 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 I mean, we have atlas here, yes. And we have all kinds of references to mythology that uh, are important for architecture, but we, we, we don't 
we don't use them any longer. That was the meaning of this head here. I'm sure those people at that time knew. Right? Isn't it interesting? I mean, this provokes the imagination. Even if you know the story, it makes you feel connected with uh, previous times on the spiral of time. That's why it's so important, I think, to be able to tell a story through your building and not just be concerned only with space, space and nothing but space, with white walls and nothing else and functionalism. It's majesty functionalism. I, 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 I started to hate functionalism because I think functionalism uh, uh, ruined architecture in the long run of things. And again, maybe Bernard Chumi was right. Form follows fiction, not function. That's what he said. I love this photograph. I think it's very artistic. It's in black and white, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a skillfully done uh, photograph. Nice. Carlo Maderno. <clears throat> Palazzo Barberini, a very famous palace, began in 1628. Uh, Palazzo Barberini, one of the most fascinating hidden gems in Rome. That's how uh, someone described it. Again, Palazzo Barberini. I don't know exactly what Maderno did here, but let's look at it. Carlo Maderno. The hidden gem in Rome, but Rome has many gems, some hidden, some less hidden. Now, I don't know if that glass truly belongs to the beginning of the 17th century in that form. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But the building is, and maybe he worked on the facade, Maderno. Did he do also the fountain? What about fountains? Why don't we design fountains? For example, a possible uh, provocation for the imagination of the students of the fifth year, no? A fountain with five sides or the fountain of number five for Bucharest. But it could be for another city or town or even village, why not? Although losing water now is not so advisable because uh, water is precious and we consume too much water. A spiral staircase, but a rectangular spire case. Very nice. Well, this is a digital representation of this uh, Barberini uh, palace. Now we arrive at uh, you know the the crux of uh, you know uh, Christianity in a way. No, Saint Peter's Basilica. Nothing else. If you go in Rome, you go straight to Saint Peter. I remember once I went on a Christmas, specifically I went to Rome, I wanted to, to make a film with, uh, at Christmas. And I went, I went on Christmas Eve to St. Peter and I was very, very disappointed because I, was, I felt that there was too much pomp with a, with a red carpet and so on and many people, but I didn't really feel that there was God there. So then I went to the Pantheon and the, the Pantheon, I felt a little bit better, although pan, the Pantheon is a, is a pagan temple. And, but even there, the Pantheon, uh, you know, the, the young Italians were meeting, they were dating, you know, uh, romantically people on uh, Christmas Eve. So I left alone and miserable, and I so-called found God near a ruined fragment of a wall near the, um, near the train station, near Stanzione Termini. And I made then, I remember, I made a very moving um, video. I had a video camera with me. This was many years ago. Uh, unfortunately, I lost it. But uh, what I wanted to say is that you go, uh, you know, you go to St. Peter to, you know, on Christmas Eve, you expect to, 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 to to, to be at the, you know, to, to, to be in touch with the highest celebration of Christmas, no, at St. Peter. And I didn't feel, I didn't really feel the, 
you know, the, the presence of, 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 of the, what is magical about Christmas. And then I, I, I went downwards, so to speak, the Pantheon and then the train station. And I, I, I arrived at, at, at some kind of an intuition of the sacredness of the moment, Christmas Eve, in the least spectacular and, uh, you know, uh, glittering part of Rome, near the train station. So what I'm trying to say is that I think, you know, those who say that God is everywhere, I think they are right. And sometimes you find God, so to speak, in the least uh, auspicious, uh, you know, circumstances or places. It depends what you feel. It's actually maybe about the inner God, the one that uh, that is within, and then you project it without. Sorry about this uh, digression. So let's look at the plans of San Pietro. There was on on the site of San Pietro. There was the old Saint Peter in the fourth century, and you see the plan. Then Bramante in the fifth in fifteen o six drew the plan of the new San Pietro, the way you see it, the second picture. The third one was by Michelangelo, which was not so different from Bramante's, except that he kind of uh, had a rotation. You see, it has the, 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 the square here, and then he has another rotated square in a way. And then the, the, the power of the diagonal is more accentuated in Michelangelo's plan. And you know, if you have a square and you use a square with the same side, side, the same length of the side, if you rotate it with the same center at 45 degrees, you can build a, um, rigorously an octagon. And then Maderno, you see, he lengthened the nave and created a new facade of, 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 of uh, uh, San Pietro. So there, there is, in a way, maybe you could see some relationship with the old St. Peter going through two intermediate phases, Bramante and Michelangelo, and then Carlo Maderno in 1607, 1612. Well, you see there are already more than 100 years since Bramante to Maderno. The building is now like this. It has this part, which is uh, almost identical with what, uh, in fact, it is identical to what Michelangelo uh, planned. And in fact, he, he started the construction of, of the new San Pietro in this way. So here was Michelangelo, and then Maderno lengthened the nave and created the new facade. So Maderno was an, uh, an important architect. Some say that he weakened the scheme done by Michelangelo. Maybe. We don't know. But, but today, San Pietro is like this, and Maderno had a, a, a significant role. Pianta della Basilica San Pietro in, in Vaticano. Here it is. And the Pope you know, on Christmas, and I don't know on Christmas, but uh, on, uh, on Easter, talks from this balcony, and there is a multitude of people here, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people. I remember once I was here at Easter, and I, I made a little video with the event, and I remember it amused me to, to film or to photograph the, the leather boot of a policeman who was just near me, of course, I, I, I was careful not, not to see me, uh, him not to see me, but I, I, I was seduced by the, the incredible shine of the tall leather boot of the policeman near me. And I, I, I fantasized about, you know, here it was Easter uh, in front of San Pietro in Rome with the Pope talking there to the populace and so on. Because, uh, yes, the Italians are very religious, not to say, uh, you know, uh, great, uh, great believers. But, they, you know, even if it is Easter or, or, uh, or, or Christmas, they are still, uh, you know, seducers. I'm talking particularly about men, so they love to date. And I saw it clearly, you know, in, at, at the Pantheon. 
you know, with uh, motorcycles or uh, scooters, um, you know, handsome young people. Anyway, Roma, Basilica di San Pietro. The dome belongs to Michelangelo. The facade belongs to Carlo Maderno, who was who died on the 30th of January. And with many chairs here waiting for uh, for people to to meet uh, to meet the Pope. And then the colonnade of Bernini here and uh, the obelisk here in this in front of San Pietro, an irreverent um, or irreverential um, postmodern architect Leon Krier proposed a triangular a swimming pool right here in this plaza, you know, between the two sides of, uh, of uh, Bernini's colonnade and in front of Carlo Maderno's uh, facade of the of, uh, of, of, of the building. Incredible. And he was a lover of, of the past, he claimed, Leo Creer. So this facade was done by Carlo Maderno, the man we are paying homage to today. Architectural elements of the facade, balustrade, upper cornice, capital, bell room, parastas, coping, cope, Pink, uh, dripstone, lower cornice, the frieze, the architrave, capital, shaft, and base. Now, make a section through the wall of one of your buildings, and uh, the, the, what is of interest is actually inside the thickness of the wall, and not so much towards the outside. Here, the wall inside was just that, either brick or stone or whatever material you use. But in today's world, the wall is flat, probably white or gray, but the complexity is inside the wall. The sandwich with uh, insula insulating insulation materials with uh, all kinds of sophistication, there is inside the thickness of the wall, but towards the outside, we have almost nothing. Mostly a blank, white or grayish wall. Things change because we don't use any longer sculpture. Our walls do not communicate any longer. They are very, very often flat, blunt. Uh, well, sometimes, yes, we play uh, with, with certain materials, but not, not dramatically in general. Uh, there are exceptions. Now we go to the second uh, architect designer that we pay homage to today, actually a designer, uh, mainly a designer, uh, Finn Jul. I don't know if I pronounce well, uh, his name, and unfortunately I forgot to, to check his uh, pronunciation, the pronunciation of his name, 1912, 1989, so he died at uh, 77. So Finn Jul, uh, born on the 30th of January, so he was born on the day when Carlo Maderno died, but a different year, of course, uh, was a Danish architect, interior and industrial designer most, most known for his furniture design. He was one of the leading figures in the creation of Danish design in the 1940s, and he was the designer who introduced Danish modern to America. And indeed, mid-century Danish uh, aesthetics is very valued, uh, especially in the field of um, uh, furniture making. So Finn Jul was born on, on January 30th, 1912, to an authoritarian father, who was a textile wholesaler representing several English, Scottish, and Swiss textile manufacturers in Denmark, and the mother who died shortly after he was born. From an early age, he wanted to become an art historian, 
already as a teenager spending much time at the Statens Museum for Kunst, the museum of the State Museum of Art, and in spite of his young age, receiving permission to borrow books at the Neikarsberg Gliptothek, but his father convinced him instead to pursue a career in architecture. He was admitted to the architecture school at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts, where from 1930 to 1934, he studied under K. Fisker, a leading architect of his day, a noted lecturer. This was the man. He does look like a Dane. Uh, and uh, yes, they, they, have, they had and have great, uh, great designers, these, uh, these Danes. And, uh, you know, we, we know, of course, of uh, uh, Bjarke Ingels, but uh, the, there are others. And of course, the, the even greater architect, John Hudson, who designed um, the Sydney Opera uh, building, but also other very important buildings. Drawings by this uh, designer, architect turned designer. He designed many, many pieces that were very, very successful in the United States and Europe. And uh, the craftsmanship of Denmark is astonishing. So it's not just the purity of the design, but also the, the rigor, the, the know-how the, of, of the craftsmen. They have a great uh, tradition and a great uh, industry that manufactures uh, uh, pieces of furniture, impeccable pieces of furniture. So mid-century Danish design is famous worldwide. I once in New York, I found a chair uh, by Hans Wagner, uh, the king of chairs, Danish himself, a Dane, uh, thrown to the garbage. And of course I took it home. It was by him. And it was even stamped in, at, at the back, at the bottom of the seat in wood, where it was made in Denmark. And, uh, you know, sometimes you can find riches because people don't know what they have and they throw away things that are very valuable. Try to design a chair. This is my suggestion to you. It's very therapeutic. You don't need the... Uh, you know, a lot of things. You have a pencil and a piece of paper or you, or you design it on the web or, I mean, digitally. Uh, it's very therapeutic. Why? Because a chair, more than a building, is kind of a... It turns out to be, if you are serious about it and, uh, you know, uh, you feel it, kind of a self-portrait. A good chair if it's uh, genuinely expressing the thoughts and the feeling of its creator, it's kind of a self-portrait. It's more difficult for a building to be because a, a building requires, uh, you know, the, the action of other people and, you know, uh, it's a more complicated story. But a chair, a chair does say something in a deep way about you. And you know that uh, chair painted by Vincent van Gogh, the great uh, uh, Dutch uh, painter, uh, that, that chair is a, is a, is a, is a self-portrait of, uh, of the great painter. Try to make a chair and you'll see that not only you'll have great satisfaction, but I think you'll have a great satisfaction because something deep from within is externalized in that chair. If the chair is a genuine creation, you don't try to copy a chair done by someone else, but you make a chair. And most modern masters designed chairs, and not only chairs. Frank Lloyd Wright did. Louis, Louis Sullivan didn't. And Louis Kahn didn't, but Miss Van der Rohe did, Le Corbusier did, Alvar Alto did. It's a very interesting problem how to make a chair, you know, because it seems simple. But to make it aesthetically pleasing and to make it, uh, uh, you know, uh, a novel thing, a new thing, and to make it also comfortable, it's not so easy. Now, the, his own house in Denmark, 
uh, is uh, shown in the following images. I, I like this house, it's very simple, but it has sophistication and uh, you know, it's very unassuming. It's not a house that screams at you, look at me, no. But you can see that it's well designed. It's, it's, it, 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 there is a distinctiveness here. It, it has some dignity, but not, a, not an alarmingly, you know, uh, uh, opulent, if I can say so, dignity. It's, it's a modest dignity. And I think the Danes are very good at this in general. Well, Bjarke Ingels is an exception. But in general, they are very reticent and, uh, and uh, they do quality work, but they are not, that they don't provoke generally, the Danes don't provoke uh, scandals. This irritated a great uh, Danish uh, philosopher, Zeren Kierkegaard, who was complaining that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to be exceptional in the Danish culture which is a culture of the majority and you cannot stand out. But since Zeren Kierkegaard's time, things change. So today we have Bjarke Ingels and his big office. I mean, the very fact that he called it big is, is, is a betrayal of what, uh, of the pattern described by Zeren Kierkegaard. I like this house with its simplicity. Now, of course you wonder, you know, with training in architecture, how could he erect this white wall directly from the earth without a base? Uh, you know, I think in, if in our country we do something like this, at the meeting between the earth and the wall, there would be a lot of uh, a lot of problems, infiltrations of water and so on. And, and the climate in Denmark is not gentler than in our country. But even here, I seem to see some uh, shades of possible infiltrations of water, or I don't know what. Anyway, this is very unusual. No, I mean, with a classical training in architecture, you wouldn't do something like this. But it seems uh, even in a, in no way, a gentler uh, climate, uh, like in Denmark, is possible. And of course, then you achieve a certain purity of design with this white wall, which emerges from the earth without the transition of a, you know, uh, of a platform and so on. A sitting house. I, I, I read it and I hope I have images from the inside that his skill as an interior designer is more shown at the, at the interior of the house. But the exterior too, and I think he modeled here, he was dealing with an existing house and he just uh, refurbished it and transformed it, extended it too. Now look at that beautiful tree against the white wall of the house. Very, very nice. Uh, you see, with simple means, you can do sometimes wonders. If, if you are sensitive and uh, you listen to the nature that you are, uh, you know, uh, positioning your building in and the interior. He probably designed also the, the, the seats, the, the armchairs. Well, we are mid-century, we are in the modern age, we are different from Carlo Maderno here. Books and, uh, you know, the, the serenity of uh, artworks that, that do not uh, uh, disturb us with uh, excessive uh, expression. Denmark. I read that the Danes are those who are the happiest people on earth, but when I was once in Denmark, I have to say I was very nervous and I, I had the impression that they are nervous too, that, or maybe I made them nervous. I don't know. I didn't feel so, uh, I didn't feel uh, that the country is so peaceful as it, as it is described uh, on the news all the time, the happy Danes. And you know why they are happy? That's what I read. 
they are happy because they don't have expectations. So when you don't have expectations, you are not uh, disappointed because uh, you know you didn't expect something incredible to happen. So then you are not disappointed. Maybe that's a, a reason why you could achieve some kind of a you know peace of mind. I love these pieces of furniture by by, by the Danes. I mean, look at that wood. You know how lyrically and functionally at the same time is 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 used. I remember that chair that I told you that I, I found it in the, in the garbage container in your city it was extremely light. I could have uh, lifted it with, a, with one finger, the small finger, uh, because it was made, the wood that it used was thick, which is, you know, very strong wood, but very lightweight. So I imagine these are also extremely lightweight and extremely solid at the same time. I like this unassuming uh, aesthetics very much. Denmark. A great country. And uh, I think they, are only, uh, they only have 5 million people. So almost a quarter of the population of Romania. This is a summer house uh, from 1950, but no picture. I couldn't find picture, sorry. And now Finn Jules at the beach. A rarely seen beach house. Maybe it's this one though, probably. Some, yeah, it's a summer house, sorry. Um, a rarely seen beach house by Finn Jules on the rugged northern coast of Denmark shows the architect's genius for holistic design in a new light. The simple house cast a spell over the owner who embarked on a renovation project that honored Jules rather than worshiped him, making a liv livable holiday home, not a temple. And indeed, th this seems to be very typical for, for the Danes, for Denmark, making a livable home, but not a temple. His design, I don't know who wrote this, is a dialogue between inside and outside. He knew exactly where to sit, to site this house, where the wind came from, nothing was left to change. Maybe we can call his approach a, function, a, a, a lyrical functionalism or a functional lyricism. It is indeed very nice. And yes, it is possible with simple means to do a lot. Although I am, you know, all the time carrying on a, a fight with the T-square and the rectangle, the truth is we can make quality architecture also with the T-square and the rectangle. It's possible and we have an example right here. And I like oblongs and I think oblongs have a great potential in architecture. Uh, in present times, you don't use oblongs, but they are very useful. You filter light, you banish noise, uh, and even aesthetically, the, the oblongs uh, create a movement on the facade. I like them very much. Too bad that if you make them a wood, you have to cut down trees. A single family house, also in Denmark, 1952. This one is a little bit more adventurous. I mean, in terms of aesthetics. So this famous designer also designed a few houses. Now a shop in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, 1956. Maybe selling also his pieces of furniture, maybe. They seem to be Danish but I don't know if by him. Uh, another summer house, 1962. Now this seems to be a little dated. Now mid century, mid 20th century, it's true. But I'm sure the quality of life inside this is, is high. Even if it's not so-called spectacular towards the outside. 
I remember if you want to see one of the greatest films, the greatest movies ever made, I, I recommend to you, I suggest to you to watch Persona, P-E-R-S-O-N-A by Ingmar Bergman, a Swede, in my opinion, the greatest film director ever. Although he saw that Andrei, Andrei Tarkovsky was the biggest, uh, the, the most important uh, film director, but it's difficult to make these hierarchies. Ingmar Berman was great, and, and, and Persona is a beautiful film that, that was filmed inside his home um, summer house. I, I don't even know if it was just summer house. It was the house where, where Ingmar Berman lived, and similar kind of with what we see here. Try to watch uh, Persona, a beautiful film, truly one of the best films ever made. And you'll see also the house of Igmar Bergman, and you'll, you'll, you'll be reminded of, of this house, perhaps, uh, from this presentation. Now in, in, uh, in Denmark, like in uh, other Scandinavian countries, the home is very, very important because the climate is not so gentle, it's not so kind. So the home is there where you warm yourself up, where you find intimacy. So it's in a way, you know, uh, the, 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 the ideality of, 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 of the interior is what makes a house, what transforms a house into a home. And the, the homeliness of, of, of the house in Denmark or Norway or Sweden, I think is in contrast with the climate, which is rather harsh with, uh, you know, uh, long nights, with uh, many days without sunlight and so on. And there is a cult of the home. And I think they, they, they do excel in, in, in creating very comfortable, although modest interiors, but Re refined, sophisticated interiors, furniture designs by this uh, designer, uh, Finn Jul, Jul, if I pronounce well his name, uh, here is a, you can probably, if you, if you like this design, you can probably find, um, you know, one of his chairs or one of his pieces of furniture on eBay, you can purchase it. Uh, these were done, you see, they, they were uh, exported to the United States. And the mid-century in the United States was, um, you know, uh, very open to um, importing uh, Scandinavian designs, particularly Danish designs. Beautifully crafted. What else can I say?
<clears throat> now we see a, an ancient, uh, you know, chair on the left and uh, a chair by him. I don't know if, if they are really, maybe it was an inspiration for what he did. I don't know, maybe. A good architect can do object design, can do urbanism, can do everything. Because the relationship between architecture and industrial design and urbanism is organic, really. They, 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 they all of them have to do with design, with the visual manipulation of, uh, you know, formulating ideas in, in, in ways that are, in my opinion, similar. interesting piece that's it so let's wish him happy birthday and let's uh, mourn uh, the death of carlo maderno and that was it today thank you very much <laughs>